once you've achieved obscene levels of product market fit, there's almost a pathological desire to go find new business vistas. And it happens to the best and the worst. Perhaps this is a feature of capitalism or maybe it's a bug. You decide. But in 2019, things were going uh, swimmingly at Tinder. We were making money hand over fist. I was focused supremely on the core experience and just making sure that all of it worked exactly as it should. All the monetization flowed like wine and uh, there was no hitches. Um, it was actually working so well, um, no one could believe it. But um, I heard a little whisper in my ear that it was time to create the second act for the app. And deep in my core, I knew this was a mistake. This was driven by the markets, by Wall Street, it wasn't driven by users. But I was privy to a lot of data suggesting that the users uh, that were consummating relationships on the app were moving into the physical world. Places like bars, restaurants, nightclubs, gyms, parks, cafes, etc. So I concocted a plan to create what is some would call uh, the closed loop. So it starts on Tinder, there's an offer, goes into the physical world, people meet up, they redeem it, comes back to Tinder. Now we're in this beautiful transactional flow, this circle. But while building this product, I knew, I knew all along that this was a stretch. I knew that we were going a little bit too far, but I did it anyways because I had to. And we spent millions and millions of dollars and so much time and resources focusing on act two. And when we released it, I knew right away it wasn't going to work. And it wasn't going to work because it wasn't what the users wanted. They never asked for it. I saw data that they did meet, but that didn't mean they were raising their hand for this product. We invented this product for a business purpose and paid the price. It ultimately failed. I'm happy to answer any questions if there are any. What were the factors that made it so obvious that it was going to be a failure once you once you released it? Hey, Brian, thanks for uh, taking the stage here with the story. Uh, were there positive user feedbacks to that product also? And if there were positive user feedbacks, how do you guys decide to not over-index on them uh, and ultimately that this was a failure? Hi, Naga. Thank you for sharing. Personally, I think this is an excellent story, which is uh, seen to propagate in many businesses in uh, different uh, product service uh, areas, like also in pharmaceutical. What I sometimes feel is, uh, and I think this is coming laterally from your conversation here, is that a lot of times people think that the product is a king and nothing else matters, which means that the business model innovation doesn't um uh, give a good choice uh, to uh, innovate and sometimes a proud product heritage can get in the way and I think this is what happened for Tinder in, in your case and I was wondering like are there times were there times in this uh, decision making where you know for your gut uh, it didn't work uh, were there times where you realize that the lines are blurring between the product and the service and um, that a lot of people around you were not seeing that just because they were stuck in a particular heritage business model scenario. And the other question I had was when this particular business model was decided to be taken care of or followed, was it uh, assessed uh, using the same economic and financial matrix as the original Tinder app? Or was it that uh, just that the data was out there and therefore people didn't like miss people didn't completely make a good correlation of that data and the product do not match and it's just a normal data that can be seen for a particular psychological behavior from human beings um, because this goes in the direction of product psychology versus human psychology which are sometimes seem to be overlapping although many times they might be working in completely different ball game domains it would be great if you shed some light on that Hi, Brian. Thanks for sharing. That's a great story. So one question I have is, given that this was a change that was really instigated by someone's interpretation of a set of data, and they had a theory of what that data was showing, um, rather than the market 
crying out for a solution to a problem they actually had. How did the organization, or how did Tinder kind of roll back out of this feature? Um, it sounded like, from what you were saying about millions of dollars, it was quite a large build out. So there probably wasn't a few things that could be tweaked to make it work. So kind of what happened with this as a feature and how much of an impact did that have on Tinder as a platform? Evolved all sorts of bells and whistles and switches. We had a female PM. Tens of millions of daily active users, there's always going to be a small percent of the population that love it and a small percent of the population that hate it. Generally, the hate it crowd is louder, better organized, and in fact, more devious. Um, I think that goes for really any scale product, but the loud people are pretty damn ornery. Um, but we had a very simple metric that we knew immediately would tell us whether or not this would work. And there was a location permission involved and most people didn't toggle it. And so when they didn't toggle it, we knew right off the bat that there was a big problem. I always used to explain the relationship between a good product and a good business model is a lot like a symphony. You know it when you hear it, it all fits together, it's cohesive. Um, it's elegant, and it doesn't force anything. Five years post-product market fit with tens of millions of daily active users and billions of dollars of top-line revenue per year, I would say upwards of 70% of our product roadmap was driven by expectations from Wall Street. When you have a core product that people will walk through glass to get to, and you launch an ancillary product that's a dud, you kill it, you mothball it, into the crypt and within 48 hours no one even remembers i partially meant my last as you said you knew within 48 hours that people didn't what happened and you, you knew instinctively from the beginning that sort of no matter what you did you weren't going to be able to fix this new product what has been a launch new generating opportunity of the hit product market fit again or is it really still just operating that core business that existed from the beginning and like slightly optimizing it here or there but like sort of the, the product is somewhat complete and not really going to change. I have used Tinder very little and I've been married for a few years, so um, forgive my ignorance on the app itself today. In the early days pre um, this new product, we did run a few small tests um, in a rather haphazard manner. Um, another learning there, which was we were really gung-ho to build the product, so we just didn't trust the data and said, ah, just must not be right. The Landing pages aren't well designed. The copy's not slick. Uh, maybe there's performance issues on Android. And so, of course, we kind of walked ourselves back from the truth of that data. But how I knew is that when we did launch, um, we just were looking at the screen saying, like, this has to instrument up. But that's not how it is. Um, you know, permissions are binary, right? People are in or they're out. And most people were out and they were never coming back in. And so two days into it, I just said, put a fork in it. Outside of what some people have called one of the greatest subscription businesses of all time, uh, not much has been built. It's really interesting because I hadn't considered what happens when you achieve product market fit with a product at scale, which has investors on board. And it switches from being product-based development. So you're trying to find your product market fit and you're trying to please your users to being kind of a business investor fit where the direction of the product can be more aligned with what the investors want out of the business rather than what the users. And it seems like that would be um, quite challenging if you're a product person. Once you start making gargantuan sums of money, 
there are only two goals, preserve the golden goose and grow the golden goose. And anything that gets in the way of that will either get you fired or made chairman of the board within five years. Much more likely fired, though. It's so interesting hearing this from someone who's actually been there and done it at scale and helped Tinder become what it is today. So if you could give any advice to people working on a product, trying to achieve product market fit, what would it be? Is it really applicable to generalize um, the pursuing of new business opportunities? Because Tinder is a special case of where people stop using the product once the problem or is solved. So you bring up a very good point, a very wise point, I might say, which is uh, what's the terminal fate of a dating app post-match? And I've wrestled with this question for over a decade, and I still don't have an answer. Right now, um, it doesn't indicate that the customer wants much more from dating apps, but I also think we might be limited to our imagination. And all it's going to take is some enterprising entrepreneurs to show us the way. So I'm sure there is a way. I'm sure that someone will crack the code, but it's not going to be me. The other way to look at this is what problem are these apps solving? Are they solving discovery? Are they solving conversation? Are they solving places to go in the real world? Lots of heavy questions here. Take on this as well. What should to me that there are generally three fates. There are the Coca-Colas who also gain an incredibly deep, obscenely deep moat, and they just keep growing forever. People love them, investors love them, and they just issue ever-increasing dividends. There's what Microsoft has done, which is just growing through M&A instead of innovating in-house. Uh, not everyone can pull it off, but Sadia has done a great job. And more typically, what Mark Cuban calls diversification. People just go into these fields that they have um, no business doing any business in. And Amazon uh, is doing a very good job as well. So it's movies. I think the holy grail really is to just continue innovating in within a company as um, much as possible forever. Achieve that in a laws of dynamical and complex systems uh, with critical masses. Yeah, I suppose this is related to what Google did with their 20% time, um, which was the source of a lot of innovation within Google in the early years, and also what they try to do with Google X. Um, where, or, and skunkworks type projects where you have small teams that are outside the main organization and can innovate relatively untouched by the more bureaucratic processes within the main org. Um, and then if something takes off, you can roll it in or put your brand on it then. Yeah, outside the box, keep innovating. But typically, it doesn't really work. The innovations never get big enough to make a dent in the cash pile. So the cash pile from the main business just grows faster than um, any of the innovation that comes out. So then when they have a lot of money, um, they either issue it as dividends or they do what Brian said. They just um, try to make this big change in the um, core product that then messes it up a lot. One of the where cases that didn't happen is Tencent uh, with QQ. They cannibalized the business, a billion dollar, almost billion dollar business and created WeChat. But, um, like what Brian said, it's pathological. And, um, most of the time, you know, you don't have a QQ to WeChat situation. You have a Tinder to worst Tinder situation.